all the things that you have to do, the things that are in normal print you don't have to do. And remember that what I do is not what you guys have to do. To pass this test, you have to show me the tests, you have to discuss abnormal results, you have to discuss some pathology and some anatomy, but what you choose to discuss, the level, the more you talk about, the better you would do on your exam. But I've packed in a lot just to give you various ideas and examples. You don't have to uh, do everything that I'm going through, okay? This is, as long as you're including some in each section, you're gonna be fine. Cool? Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do is start out looking at cognitive function. So I'm gonna be looking at uh, his personality, uh, the way he's able to uh, discuss his case history, that's frontal lobe. I'm gonna be looking at memory issues, which might be related to temporal lobe hippocampus. I'd also be looking at uh, whether or not his mood and behavior was appropriate, so emotional liability, that might be related to temporal lobe, looking at the limbic system. So as we start, I'm going to start looking at whether or not he seems oriented to the date and to the place. Um, I'm gonna be listening to the fluency of his speech, so I might be listening for Broca's dysphasia, which is difficulty with word production, but he's able to actually get the words out. I might be looking for Wernicke's dysphasia, which could be receptive in that he doesn't understand what I'm trying to tell him or Recep uh, expressive, which is where he's using inappropriate vocabulary when he talks to me. I could be looking for evidence of dysarthria, which is difficulty coordinating uh, the movements. Could be coming from a cerebellar lesion, could be a facial lesion affecting muscles of the mouth, could be a hypoglossal lesion affecting the muscle of the tongue, could be coming from glossopharyngeal and vagus affecting the musculature of the throat. I could be looking for dysphonia, which is coming again from the glossopharyngeal and vagus, looking at vocal cord production, in which case he would have kind of a hoarse voice, softness to the voice. If I had any concerns about uh, his either ability to, to articulate or maybe he was having difficulty in answering questions, I could do a mini mental status test. So I'm gonna start out with my register test. Repeat these three words, cow, window, cloud. Cow, window, cloud. Okay. Then I'm gonna ask him to name objects around the room. What's that? Pillow. What's this? Table. What's that? Footstool. Then I could ask him to draw something for me. I could ask him to follow a three-stage command, so stand up for me. Raise your right arm. Wave at me. Good, sit back down. Okay, I could also ask him to write something. I might be looking for micrographesthesia, which you sometimes see in early Parkinson's. Um, if I had concerns, I could then do a mini mental status test looking at primitive reflexes. So I'm gonna tap you between the eyes. I want you not to blink. This is Bill Beller. Abnormal reflexes that he wouldn't be able to withstand blinking. Just hold your hand out for me, don't do anything. So grasp reflex, he would be unable to keep his hand extended, or I can do pelementar looking for quivering in the mentalis muscle. Now I'm gonna do my recall test. Can you please tell me those three words I asked you to repeat earlier? Cow window cloud. Okay. If I had concerns, I could also then go into calculations, like counting back from 100 by uh, minus seven. I could ask him to draw a clock face, putting it at 10 after 11. I could ask him to uh, calculate going upwards. There's all sorts of different things that I could do, okay? If he has a lack of orientation, so he's confused about where he is, that could be something like a meningitis, encephalitis, abscess, could be some sort of recreational drug, could be that he's having an adverse reaction to a medication. If I thought that he had a cognitive issue, that could be a frontal lobe tumor, <coughs> or it could be maybe some sort of diffuse thing like you've got Alzheimer's obviously, or you could have uh, dementia, maybe a multi-infarct dementia coming from multiple uh, miniature vascular defects going through the brain, okay? Next, I'm gonna go through and start with my cranial nerve. So the first cranial nerve is the olfactory nerve. I would ask if he's had a defect in his sense of smell, which is a nosemia. I could test that using coffee or chocolate or strong scents. And this could be caused by anything from simple sinusitis, polyps, uh, fracture to the cribriform plate, you could have a frontal lobe lesion where the olfactory bulb is, so like a tumor, or you could have damage into the olfactory cortex in your temporal lobe. Next, I'm gonna go through and look at the optic nerve, which looks at visual acuity, so I could ask him to read fine print from a distance. And if he had blurring, which is the abnormal, this might be a macular degeneration, cellophane maculopathy, maybe retinal detachment, glaucoma, or cataracts. Uh, after that, I might look at the ophthalmoscope, looking into the eyes. I'd be looking for evidence of papilledema, which is swelling of the optic nerve head. So I'd be looking at blurring of the margination, paleness of the color, you see that typically in MS, enlargement of the optic cup, more than 50%, tortuosity of vessel, blood vessels, exudates, raw spots, uh, lack of venous pulsations. Raised intracranial pressure could be because of a bleed in the brain, maybe hydrocephaly, maybe cerebral edema, again related to infection like a meningitis or something like that. After that, I'm gonna start looking at his fields of vision, so the four quadrants. So what I want you to do is cover your right eye for me. 
Now let's just put the gaze right on me, okay? Tell me you see my fingers. Yeah. Okay. And what I'm doing is I'm looking yeah. for pattern defects. Yeah. So I could be looking for yeah. monocular yeah. blindness. So that would be caused by problems with the optic nerve. So compression is it's going through the optic foramen, or maybe you were looking at MS causing optic neuritis. If he had a loss of a visual field on one side, that would be an optic tract defect. If he had narrowing of his vision, that would be a pituitary adenoma, perhaps, at the optic chiasm. If he had a loss of a upper field, then that would be a uh, temporal radiation problem. If he had a loss of a lower field, that would be a parietal radiation problem. And he could also have uh, cortex blindness coming from the occipital lobe, maybe because of a posterior cerebral arterial occlusion. Next, what I'm going to do is test for visual neglect. So I want you to, again, cover your right eye for me and point to which of my fingers is moving. This one, this one, five. Okay, this is looking at a posterior parietal cortex lesion. So looking at your S2, typically would be accompanied after stroke. Next, what I'm gonna do is test my uh, optic nerve and ocular motor nerve together by doing pupillary reflexes. Make a bridge with your hand. Sorry. Make a bridge with your hand. And I shine this light into your eyes, look straight ahead. So I'm doing direct reflex, looking for constriction of the light I'm shining the eye into. The sensual reflex, looking for constriction into the opposite eye. So the mechanism of this, optic nerve is sensory, picks up the light triggering action potential along the axon at the end of west ball nucleus, they're connected, triggers bilateral constriction at, of the ciliary muscle uh, to keep the light out of the eye because that's damaging. So a lack of constriction would be a optic nerve problem. Unilateral constriction could be a problem with the ciliary muscle, could be a problem with the ocular motor muscle. Next, what I'm gonna do is look at ocular motor itself so this is going to oversee elevation of the eyelid, so I'd be looking for ptosis. I'm also going to expect the pupils, looking for irregularity of the uh, iris. I'm going to look for meiosis, that's shrinking of the pupil. That could be because of a parasympathetic mimetic or old age. I'm going to look for mydriasis, enlargement of the pupil. That could be because of a sympathetic mimetic, or maybe they're on some sort of recreational drug. Anascoria, unequalness of the pupils. 20% of the population is physiologic, but if somebody had had a recent head trauma, that could be evidence of a raised intracranial pressure like a epidural hematoma. Next, what I'm gonna do is look at the accommodation reflex. So I want you to look into the distance, please. Good, now look at my finger. And as he focuses in from long vision to short, I should see convergence of the pupils and shrinking of the, uh, convergence of the eyes and shrinking of the pupils. And this is literally a change from long vision to short. So it's testing ocular motor in and of itself. Next, I'm gonna check ocular motor, trochlear, and adducens together. So the adducens innervates the lateral rectus, allowing for abduction of the eye. The trochlear does the superior oblique, so it allows the eye to come in and out. Ocular motor does all the rest of them. So I'm gonna start out with my smooth pursuit. I want you to keep your head still and just follow my pen with your gaze. So I'm looking for full range of motion, coordinated motion, smooth motion, so no psychotic jerking. I'm looking for nystagmus at the end range. I'm looking to see if he's got any problems with double vision if they're going through. Okay. Now convergence, watching the eyes medially deviate, and then coming back out. A little bit of constriction of the pupils as we're coming in closer. So problems with this, you would have, if it was ocular motor, it could be midbrain. If you're looking at tri uh, the trochlear abducens, you could be looking at pontine lesions causing issues there. Or you could be looking at your supraophthalmic uh, nerve palsy. Uh, in which case you would have the vestibular ocular reflex being spared. So what I want you to do is keep your gaze on me, and I'm just going to move your head. Oh, you sorry, keep your gaze on me, that's it. <laughs> okay, so that would allow me to distinguish between those two points. What I could then do is start to check, again, looking at frontal lobe, because he's able to use voluntary movements to move his eyes. So I'm going to do saccade. So what I want you to do is I want you to look up, look at my face. I want you to look to the right, look at my face to the left, to my face, down, to my face. So making sure he can follow voluntary commands, but also looking at how he's able to visually orient back onto my gaze. So if he had a lack of ability to orient and maybe he was searching, that might be indicative of more of a cerebellar problem coming in, so dysmetry of the gaze. Or if he was having trouble coordinating the eye movements, that might be a problem with the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which essentially is the piece of anatomy that yokes three, four, and six together. Okay, next I'm gonna test the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve has got three branches, ophthalmic at the top, maxillary, and mandibular. So it innervates spatial sensation and also the muscles of mastication. I'm gonna start out testing the sensory nucleus of the trigeminal nerve located into the pons. I want you to close your eyes for me and say yes when you feel it. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, now I'm gonna test the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve, say yes when you feel it. Yes, yes, 
okay? If I had concerns as to whether he was picking up pressure rather than nociceptive impulse, what I would do is a deeper screen. So this is blunt, this is sharp. Again, keep your eyes closed, tell me which is which. Sharp, blunt, 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 sharp. And continue to randomly alternate up to eight times. Normal would be 100% uh, accuracy of eight goes. If not, I'd go up to 10 goes and then grade it on a scale of full recognition, altered recognition, no recognition whatsoever. Okay. After that, what I would be looking at doing is looking at the muscle domestication. So I want you to grit your teeth for me. So I'm palpating the masseter, palpating the temporalis. So I'm looking for atrophy, hypertrophy, or some sort of asymmetry. Mm -hmm. I could then test strength with turquoise. I want you to deviate your jaw that way. Resist me. Holding for a count of five. And then I could do the jaw jerk reflex. I'm just going to get you to open your mouth a little bit. Relax. Testing each side. Shouldn't really see too much of a response, but if the jaw hung open, that would be a lower motor neuron. If it slammed shut, that would be an upper motor neuron. So problems that you might see with the trigeminal nerve, like I said, it's got its origin in the pons. So if you had a pontine branch occlusion, that would cause problems. You can also get trigeminal neuralgia, which can be idiopathic or could be because of a herpes zoster virus. Next, I'm gonna look at the facial nerve. So I'd ask about a history of dry mouth, so lack of salvation, uh, dry eyes, lack of lacrimation, Ask about changes to the gustation or taste. The facial nerve does the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Glossopharyngeal does the posterior one-third of the tongue. I could also do the sensory aspects here on this aspect of the ear if I wanted to test in exactly the same way. And then I'm going to look at his face to see if I see any obvious asymmetry when he's at rest. I'm then going to get him to move the muscles to see if I see any changes. So I want you to raise your eyebrows up, frontalis, flinch and close, orbicularis oculi, blow out your cheeks, buccinator, perch your lips, orbicularis oris, pull down the corners of your mouth, platysma. If I had concerns, I could then do resisted muscle testing as well to see if anything was going on there. So if he had an upper motor neuron problem, maybe coming from somewhere within the motor cortex or coming down along the tract, I would see one side of the face having some sort of paralysis, but the forehead would be spared. It would only be the lower aspect of the face affected. If it was a lower motor neuron problem, like Bell's palsy is fairly typical, I would see the entire half of the face having a facial droop, upper and lower aspects both being impaired. Next, I'm gonna look at the vestibulocochlear nerve. This has two branches, vestibular is balance, cochlear is hearing. I'm gonna do the vestibular testing when I come into my uh, coordination stance and gait stuff. So, looking first at the cochlear aspect, I want you to cover your opposite ear for me. Okay, I'm just gonna get you to repeat what I said. Okay, and doing the same thing on the other side, looking for any evidence of inequality. This is just a generalized screen. Now I'm gonna go in and do my Weber's test. So I'm just gonna ting this on the back. Can you hear this equally in both sides? Yes. Okay. Abnormal response is that he lateralizes. So for instance, if he lateralized to this side, then that could be a conductive problem on that side, like uh, tympanic membrane perforation, impacted earwax, autosclerosis, otitis media. If, however, he couldn't hear it on uh, this side, that could be a sensory neural aspect on that, and that could be cilia receptive damage because of ex repeated exposure to loud noise, could be nerve compression from indolence, like you see in Meniere's, could be something like an acoustic neuroma, or it could have been a severe infection causing demyelination of the nerve. Now I'm gonna try and determine which is which, so I'm gonna do my Rene's test. I'll put this on the back. Okay, now tell me when you can't hear it any longer, and I'm gonna to start to time how long he's able to listen to this. So if we pretended he said he couldn't hear it now, I'm gonna bring it forward, so can you hear it? Yes, a bit louder. louder. Tell me yes. when it stops. And continue to time how long that lasts, and then comparing to the opposite side. So normal response, air conduction is better than bone conduction. If he had a conductive problem on this side, bone would be better than air. If he had a sensory neural aspect on this side, he'd have the ears of the bat over here, but here he had total deafness, wouldn't pick it up by bone or air, more likely partial deafness, he would be able to hear better by air than bone, but it would be significantly shorter period of time. Okay, coming in and checking the glossopharyngeal in Vegas. So, Glossopharyngeal innervates upper muscles of the throat, vagus is lower muscles of the throat. They both have a role to play in vocal cord production. They both have a role to play in picking up visceral sensation as well as uh, pain reception or sensation of the throat coming up into the back of the throat, going up into the under aspect of the ear. Vagus obviously oversees all autonomic control of the viscera throughout the body. So I'm gonna ask if he has a problem with dysphagia, difficulty swallowing. I could ask him to eat or drink something in front of me if I had a concern. Again, listening for evidence of dysphonia or dysarthria if you're going through speech. Um, I would then want to look at the uvula. So, open her mouth for me. 
I'm looking to see that it hangs centrally. Say ah. Ah. Uh. Good. Keep your mouth open for me. And I'm looking at his tongue right now. So, glossopharyngeal and vagus are going to oversee the back of the throat. You're looking at the palatine to make sure that they're equally arched. Uvula shouldn't have any deviation at rest. If there's deviation, that means there's a lesion. As he says the ah, again, glossopharyngeal and vagus, you should have a central uplift. Deviation off to one side indicates a lesion. I was also looking at his tongue coming into your hypoglossal nerve that innervates the intrinsic muscles and extrinsic muscles of the tongue. So I was looking for lower motor neuron problems, which might be evidence of uh, atrophy, fasciculations, tongue curling, things like that. If I had concerns that there was something going on, he wasn't getting uvular lift in the right way, what I could also do is a gag reflex. I could ask him to open his mouth and just lightly touch the back of the throat with my tongue depressor, looking for equal contraction as a normal response. No contraction or uneven contraction would be an abnormal response. What I would also do if I was looking at vagus is I would look to see whether or not there were changes in his blood pressure, respiratory rate, pulse rate, GI tract motility, urinary, fecal control, anything like that. Problems that can go wrong. So you can have a glossopharyngeal neuralgia where the glossopharyngeal nerve is actually causing idiopathic pain, maybe because of herpes zoster. You could also be looking at your jugular foramen syndrome where 9, 10, 11, and 12 all get compressed because they're traveling through. So I'd expect to see changes into the hypoglossal nerve at the same time, maybe also the spinal accessory nerve. What I'm gonna do is just finish off my hypoglossal nerve, just protrude your tongue for me. I'm looking to see that it comes out centrally. If it deviated off to one side, that could be upper or lower motor neuron. Put it back in and stick it to the corner of your cheek. And again, having it resist against the count of five and comparing to the other side to make sure that the strength was even, okay? I'm gonna come into the spinal accessory nerve. That's gonna innervate the traps in the SCM. So first I'm gonna observe the SCM for any obvious atrophy or hypertrophy, unevenness, or maybe uh, evidence of a dystonia, like a spasmodic torticollis where he's gonna have a head tilt, climbing around to the back. Observing the traps, see if there's any obvious shoulder droop, looking to see if there's any kind of scapular winging or rotation, downward and outward rotation of the scapula. And then I'm gonna do strength testing. So I want you to bring your shoulders up for me and resist my pressure, holding for a count of five. I want you to turn your head this way for me, resist my pressure. Resisting for a count of five, I'm testing the opposite SCM. And basically, what I'm going to be doing is looking for a lower motor neuron, ipsilateral weakness, upper motor neuron, contralateral weakness. Okay, cranial nerves are basically done. I'm gonna go in and start doing my dermatome myotome reflexes. So showing you the dermatomes first. So you've got C5, C6 coming out here. You've got C7, C8, T1. So first I'm gonna test my dorsal column, medial, and meniscus. What I want you to do is close your eyes, say yes when you feel this. I'm testing C5, yes. T1, yes. turn your hand over. Okay, C6, yes. C7, yes. C8, yes. okay? So you can have <coughs> hyperalgesia or allodynia, reduced sensation, total lack of sensation, abnormal responses for any of those. What I'm then gonna do is test my nociception exactly the same manner that I discussed in the face. So again, he has to close the eyes for the test to be valid touching each of the sensory points that I've described to you above, uh, doing the deeper screen of the eight random alternations if I was worried about whether or not it was pressure or pain. Doing the same thing on the lower legs, if you just bring your feet out for me and uh, move your hands. So you've got your uh, L2, L3, L4, L5, S1, okay? And then the sensory testing areas, if you close your eyes and again just say yes. So I would have L2, yes. L3, yes. L4, yes. L5 is proximal phalanx of the third toe, and then S1 is gonna be lateral calcaneus coming around. When I'm doing my nociception, I'm testing my lateral spinal thalamic tract. Now what I'm gonna do is look at doing my myotomes uh, of the upper limbs. I want you to put up your dukes for me, okay? So what I'm doing is C5 bicep, all of these hugs for a count of five, C7 tricep, okay? What I want you to do is bring your wrist up for me, C6 wrist extensive brachioradialis, spread your fingers. T1, resisted abduction of the fifth digit. Turn your hand over. And then I've got C8, which is flexor digitorum profundus. Okay, now I'm gonna test my reflexes. So, what I want you to do is just relax your arm for me. So I've got my C5 bicep, C6 brachioradialis. Relax your shoulder, relax your arm for me. C7 tricep, and I want you just to this under your knee. Keep this up. That's it. Coming in, I've got my L4 patellar, S1 Achilles. Okay, so myotomal disturbances, lower motor neuron, I would say hypotonia, 
flaccid weakness, flaccid paralysis, upper motor neuron, hypertonia, spastic weakness, spastic paralysis, reflex, lower motor neuron, hypo or areflexia, upper motor neuron is going to be hyperreflexia or clonus, okay? And I'm going to come back and do the lower limb monotones in just a minute. Now, problems that can cause SMR effects, you might be thinking about a disc herniation, maybe a lateral stenosis of the spine. You could also see a mixture of upper and lower uh, problems. If you had, for instance, a cervical stenosis, I would see lower motor neuron uh, problems at the lesion, upper motor neuron problems going down further. What I'm going to test for next is looking at the peripheral nerves. So you've got, if you just pop up for me, you've got your C, essentially C5 distribution, but it's a military patch, so your auxiliary nerve innervating skin area here, and it's going to do your deltoid and your teres minor. You've then got your medial cutaneous skin effect only, lateral cutaneous skin effect only. You've got skin effect for the radial nerve coming down the posterior lateral aspect of the arm into the uh, lateral aspect of the palm, and this is going to innervate the extensors of the arm and of the forearm, so into the wrist. Your median nerve is going to come down and do skin effect through the hand. This is going to do most of the flexors of the wrist with the exception of flexicarpial nerus, okay? And it's going to do the intrinsic muscles of the lateral palm, ulnar nerve distribution here, and that's going to do more intrinsic muscles of the palm and flexicarpial nerus. If you're looking at the leg, so you've got, you pop back down for me, you've got your lateral cutaneous going down onto the side of the leg, skin effect only. You've got your femoral, which is basically going to come down the anterior skin effect of the thigh, medial aspect of the lower leg and foot, coming in as skin itself, innervating the quads and the knee extensors, so like your quadriceps and your hip flexors. You're going to be looking at your obturator, which is going to be skin of the medial thigh, as well as your adductors of the thigh, so bringing the leg over. You then look at your sciatic, which is going to innervate the muscles of the posterior thigh, and that's going to split into two. You've got your tibial and your perineal. The tibial puts you on to tiptoe, so it's going to do the muscles of the posterior thigh, gastrocnemius, and also the plantar muscles of the feet. And the tibial is going to have skin effect on the bottom of the foot. Your perineal essentially follows an L5 distribution in your skin effect, but perineal picks up the toes. So you're looking at dorsiflexion of the foot, so anterior tibialis and the extrinsic muscles, intrinsic muscles of the foot that would allow you to bring it up and back. Problems that would cause a peripheral neuropathy, so you could have uh, a problem with a plexus, so brachial plexus, lumbar plexus, sacral plexus. You could have a thoracic outlet causing multiple peripheral problems. You could have entrapment, so you could have ulnar entrapment at the cubital tunnel, ulnar entrapment at the tunnel of Guillain, median nerve entrapment at the uh, into the carpal tunnel. You could have a tarsal tunnel entrapping the tibial nerve into the ankle. Uh, you could have your glove and stocking distributions, so your vitamin B12, vitamin B1, Wernicke Korsakoff. Uh, you could have a diabetic neuropathy, lots of different things like that. Okay, coming in, I'm going to check some of the general somatosensory tasks. So, what I'm going to do is get you to close your eyes. I'm going to touch you on your arms and legs. I want you to point to where I'm actually touching. doing touch localization and that he should be able to narrow down the area that I've touched. That's just your simple DCML. I'm also testing the uh, sensory neglect, which would again be a posterior parietal cortex lesion, again, typically accompanying your stroke. After that, I can do limb repositioning. So I want you to close your eyes. And I'm just going to put your arm into a particular position. Okay. I want you to mimic that for me. Good. So this is looking at proprioception, DCML problems again. Um, I could also look at doing finger proprioception, so close your eyes. Okay, this is up, this is down, this is out, this is in. I want you to tell me which is which. Up, down, out. Okay. Did you say that was out? Yep. In. Good. And I would do the same thing coming onto the toe, holding on to the first um, MCP, so holding on towards the end onto the joint line itself. Again, testing uh, distal proprioception. I could do vibration sensation. Can I get you to pop up your sock? Okay, so with this, what I'm gonna do is I want you to tell me, uh, with eyes closed, are you feeling pressure or are you feeling vibration, okay? Both. Okay, 
So if he wasn't feeling any vibration there, I would work my way up. So starting at medium alveolus, tibial tuberosity, coming up to the ASIS. And again, we're feeding up into the hand. Okay? Yeah. And then I could work my way up through the solid process of the ulna, coming onto the epicondyl, coming up to the clavicle as well. Again, this is testing the DCML, vibration sensation. Uh, you would typically expect to see this maybe with your peripheral arterial disease, or again, maybe a diabetic neuropathy or something like that. You would have that loss of your kind of distal aspect. I could do graphesthesia. I want you to hold your hand out for me, close your eyes. I'm going to write a number. I want you to tell me what number I'm writing. Did I end this? Did I one time? All right, so a lack of ability to pick that up, you would again be thinking about your uh, somatosensory uh, association cortex. I could do my stereognosis test. So what I would do is get him to close his eyes, hold his hand out, and pretend I put a 50p coin in that he's not aware, getting him to close his hand around it. He should be able to identify the 50p as a coin, but also which one it is. And then putting in, again with eyes closed, maybe a 20p coin, and he should again be able to identify that that's a coin, but it's a different coin looking at the difference in the size, so 20p versus 50p. Lack of this is astereognosis. Again, you're looking at your somatosensory association cortex, so parietal, uh, posterior parietal cortex problem. So difficulties that you might cause for somatosensory aspects, obviously you could have a parietal problem, so that could be a anterior or middle cerebral artery, depending on where uh, you are getting the, the lack of sensation could be because of a DCML tract problem, so that could be because they've got a loss of posterior blood flow coming into the back of the spine. Uh, it could be, again, that he's had a stroke and so you've got damage uh, coming into those areas. What I'm gonna do now is test a little bit of coordination test looking at the cerebellum specifically. First, observing him at rest, I'm looking for resting tremor, which is indicative of, of a basal ganglia problem, or choreatic movements, which might be indicative, again, of a basal ganglia problem resting tremor, Parkinson's, choreatic movements, maybe your hunting tanks. Then what I'm going to do is I am going to get him to, you put your heel on your leg, look at me and just slide it off and kick off, okay? Looking for any tremors, you're doing it, any ataxic movement, okay? What I want you to do is take your hand on your leg and turn it over as fast as you can. Just one, other one, now together. And I'm looking to see that he can do coordinated, repetitive movements. A lot of this is dyskeidokokinesia. Next, what I'm going to do is my finger to nose test. I want you to put your finger on your nose. And what I want you to do is touch my finger. Okay, in fact. So I'm looking for whether he's got uh, intention tremor, endpoint tremor, dysmetria, which is overshooting or undershooting. Anything like that might be uh, indicative of a cerebellar problem. Now, what I'm going to do is again look at cerebellum, eighth cranial nerve, vestibular aspect proprioception coming from the feet, visual input coming in. So I'm gonna look at coordination, stance, and gait. I want you to stand up for me, just how you normally would. So I'm looking again for any major ataxic stance, any major postural sway, an exceptionally wide base stance. Uh, maybe looking to see whether there's antalgic gait, uh, anything like that. Now what I'm gonna do is narrow that up. So I want you to face that direction, put your big toes together, heels touching. Okay. I'm gonna support my patient, okay? And I'm just going to look to see what he does with his eyes open. So if there was a vestibular, a cerebellar problem, this would be difficult because I'm putting him into a narrow base balance. If he had a significant proprioceptive problem, he might find this difficult too. Close your eyes now. This right now is bringing it really into proprioceptors. So if he had a diabetic neuropathy or peripheral arterial disease, this is really going to be more positive with the eyes closed. Okay, go ahead and open your eyes for me. What I could also do since I've got him standing is I could do my uh, rebound test, so put your arms out for me like this. Okay, that's it, and close your eyes. I'm gonna push down, bring them back up to where I brought them before. Okay, so if there was going on for us, a cerebellar problem, you would see pendular sway. If it was a DCML problem, he wouldn't be able to find the point at which I'd ask him to bring it back. I could also get him to bring your arms out and hold like this. Close your eyes. This is looking at your pronator drift. I'd ask him to hold this for a minute. This is looking at cortical spinal tract weakness. Okay, and what we might find is that if he was weak, he would start to pronate and drift down over time. Okay, go ahead and open your eyes. Now what I'm gonna do is look at normal gait. So I want you just to um, walk for me. So I could see fenestrating gait with Parkinson's, choreatic gait with Huntington's, go ahead and walk. I might see antalgic gait if he had a disc herniation, come on back to me. 
I might see uh, a hemiplegic gait with an upper motor neuron like a stroke where you've got flexion of the upper body, you've got extension overpowering in the lower leg, so you get abduction of the hip. I could see a steppage gait if there was a sensory neuropathy, again, diabetic neuropathy, something like that. Um, what I'm gonna get you to do now is walk away on your tiptoes. Okay, so I'm testing my um, tibial nerve. I'm also testing my S1 gastroxylaeus as well as channel leading balance. Come back to me with your toes up. This is testing perineal nerve as well as testing your L4 tibialis anterior as well as testing balance and things like that. I could then ask him to come back to me, please. And I want you to walk as if you're on a tightrope. Again, just narrowing down his balance, supporting the patient. I could challenge that with eyes closed if I wanted to. That's great, stop, okay. And then uh, just in, in general, looking to see how he's able to handle this. Go ahead and pop back down. So if there was a cerebellar problem, then this could be caused because of general atrophy. It could be a pica, ica, SCA, or vertebral basilar um, arterial insufficiency. You could be looking at demyelination. could be looking at a cerebellar pontine ankle tumor. If he had a problem with his vestibular nerve, this could be something like Meniere's disease, labyrinthitis, acoustic uh, neuronitis, acoustic neuroma. Could again be some sort of demyelination coming in and affecting that particularly. Sensory neuropathies, we've already talked about all of those. What I'm gonna do now is get him to lay down and I'm gonna look at some of the motor aspects. So I'm gonna start out by just visually observing my patient. I'm looking at the muscle bolts and the extremities to see if I see any obvious atrophy, hypertrophy, asymmetry. If there was asymmetrical wasting, that might be more likely to be something like a lower motor neuron problem leading to wasting. If it was symmetrical, that might be an underuse atrophy, maybe from immobilization, or maybe either sedentary lifestyle or a geriatric person. Um, what I'm then gonna do is look for hypertrophy as well. So you might see muscular dystrophy, Duchenne's coming in, which is where muscle tissue is replaced by fatty tissue. So what I'm gonna do is palpate, and I'm gonna come through and palpate the major muscle bulk going through the body, I'm just gonna put my hands on the top part of your leg, and then coming on the bottom part of the leg as well. Again, looking for any differences. So again, we've talked about the differences in tone that I might feel. If there was that fibrotic tissue, you would feel a squishy kind of tone. I'd also be looking for any areas of tenderness, spasm, um, anything like that. What I'm then gonna do is start to look at joint mobility. So I could start to work through the wrists. I could look at the elbows. I could work through the ankles. Look at the knees. Okay. And what I'm looking for is evidence of hypomobility. So that could be something like your generalized osteoarthritis leading to reduction in range of motion. We talked about causalgia leading to reduction of range of motion. You could be also looking at things like your cogwheeling. So this is where they would resist kind of in a step defect, early Parkinson's, typical of that. You could see clasp knife, which is where they resist, and all of a sudden it gives way. That's an upper motor neuron response. You could see a lead pipe, which is where they've resisted. It's in contracture. That would be late Parkinson's, late Huntington's. Also post-stroke is fairly typical. Or you could have dementia response, which is where they kind of subconsciously resist the amount of pressure that you're putting in, but it's not actually a muscular problem in and of itself. I could also see hypermobility, benign hypermobility, other Stanlos, maybe Marfan, something like that. Okay, after that, what I'm gonna do is test my lower limb monotones. So I just want you to bring your knee back towards your nose. Okay, resist my pressure, cool. Okay, so I'm looking at L2 hip flexor. And again, I want you to try and turn your leg. This is your L3, your quads. And I want you to bring your big toe up for me. Okay, and resist. And this is my L5 hallux extensor. Okay, and I've already tested my L4 and my S1 when I was getting him to do tiptoe walking. What I could then do is come in and do my Babinski. So I'm gonna stroke up the lateral aspect of the foot the ball of the foot. I'm looking for extension of the big toe as your abnormal response. And that's indication of cortical spinal tract suppression or an upper motor neuron problem. Uh, I could also do chatic, which is where I might come down the lateral leg, lateral foot. Uh, if somebody was very ticklish, again, ex looking for that extension of the big toe. I could do my clonus task, looking at quick dorsiflexion, a couple of physiological beats, normal but continued beats against my hand is going to be an abnormal response. I could then look at the superficial reflexes as well. If I can get you to pull your shirt up for me. So I could look at testing some of the thoracic spinal nerves. So I'm gonna be looking at T8, T9, okay? T10, T11. And I'm looking for reasonably even contraction of the umbilicus. I'd be observing to see at rest if there was any umbilical deviation suggesting a lesion. And I could just get you to lift your head and shoulders up for me. 
again looking for deviation of the umbilicus as he's using the muscles or maybe a diastasis, a split in the muscles that you see post-pregnancy. Okay, so other motor neuron things that could happen in general, again, you might be looking at your motor cortex. So you could be looking at a middle or anterior cerebral arterial occlusion. You could be looking at a frontal lobe tumor. You could be looking at, again, loss of blood flow into the anterior aspect of the spine, uh, affecting an anterior spinal artery. So uh, you could have a transver acute transverse myelitis. You could be looking at um, something like your upper motor neuron disease, maybe your Guillain-Barre, ascending weakness coming from the extremities, your chronic demyelinating polyneuropathy, all sorts of things that would cause these types of problems. Okay, now let me just have a think to see if there's anything I've forgotten. No? Okay, then there endeth the lesson.